Good evening, everyone. Tonight we're going to have a look at a long-forgotten virgin martyr saint from the Middle Ages named St. Logofortis. She was known by various names. Um, Un St. Uncumber in England, St. Antcomer in the Netherlands, Kummernis in Germany, and St. Santa Liberata in Italy and Spain and South America. They all suggest a strong virgin to liberate those in bondage and grief. Kumar means grief. This cult was so popular at one point that it rivaled that of the Virgin Marys. It's a crucified female saint said to have become Christ-like in terms of her appearance and martyrdom. According to legend, Wilgefortis was the teenage daughter of a king in medieval Portugal. Although she'd taken a vow of chastity, her father ordered her to marry a Muslim king, or a pagan king, or the king of Sicily. Sometimes the legend says that um, she was being molested by her father. She prayed to God to make her repulsive to her fiancé or her father. God answered her prayers by making her grow a beard. Her father was so angry with her, he had her crucified in the manner of her crucified God. And she joined the ranks of virgin martyrs. The Church has historically promoted virgin martyrs as examples of chastity and faith, but the LGBT crew recognized them as kindred spirits who refused to engage in heterosexual activity. She has been interpreted as the patron saint of intersex people, an asexual person, a transgender person, even a person with polycystic ovary syndrome causing excessive body or facial hair, also called hirsutism. Her veneration began in the 14th century and grew until the 16th century. She was hosted, honored all over Europe, sometimes riv rivaling the popularity of Virgin Mary. There is often a fiddler playing in front of Vilgefortis, cru her crucified body. The fiddler was given one of her golden boots by the saint. He was sentenced to death because the people thought he stole the boot. His last request was to play for Vilgefortis once more. His wish was granted, and during the performance, Wilgefortis gave him her other boot, proving his innocence. Wilgefortis entered the Martyrologium Romanum in 18, 1583, and her feast day was July 20th. She retained a devoted following as late as the 19th century. Her cult was suppressed, and she was dropped from the feast day calendar in 1969 by the directives of the 1963 Sacrosanctum Concilium of Vatican II, which states that incongruous practices may foster devotion of doubtful orthodoxy. Uh, this is a book by Professor Ilse E. Friesen from uh, Wilfrid Laurier University in Canada and a lot of the information for this video comes from this book. Art historians argue that the origins of the cult can be found in Eastern style or Byzantium or, yeah, Byzantine representations of the crucified Christ uh, especially the Volto Santo di Luca or the Holy Face of Luca in the Cathedral of San Martino in Lucca. This is a large 11th century carved wooden figure of Christ, bearded like a man but dressed in full-length tunic rather than the familiar loincloth. Copies of the Volto Santo di Lucca were spread by pilgrims and merchants to various parts of Europe 
and they were no longer recognized as representations of the crucified Savior, but came to be looked upon as pictures of a woman who'd suffered martyrdom. The compositions were copied and brought north of the Alps over the next 150 years by pilgrims and dealers, and the unfamiliar image led to northerners to create a narrative to explain the androgynous icon. So this is the dressed carving, and this is the undressed carving. The iconography of a completely robed crucified Christ wearing a colobium, this is a colobium, which is an ankle-length tunic of white linen shift worn by British monarchy during coronation service symbolizes the divesting of oneself of all worldly vanity. But they're usually never robed or um, tied like this, or girdled, they call it. These two ends of the tie represent the merging of the Old and New Testaments. That's a colobium. The legend of the Volto Santo claims that Nicodemus sculpted the image from cedar of Lebanon. Having completed all but the face, Nicodemus slept, awakening to find the holy face completed by an angel. So that makes this relic an Akira Poeta, not made by human hands. Some more examples of Akira Poeta are the the Veil of St. Veronica and the Shroud of Turin. Nicodemus was a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin. It was supposedly discovered in a cave in the Holy Land in 1742. He carved it following his witnessing of Christ's crucifixion using the impression of Christ's body upon the burial shroud. It said he was brought to Tuscany in a boat without sails or crew and translated to San Martino in a cart pulled by oxen with no driver. Here's a portrayal of the Volto Santo by Giovanni Battista. The Volto Santo, between the 10th and 12th centuries, in the posture of the triumphant Christ, this is imagery of the, su the imagery of the suffering Christ is replaced with that of an acceptance and a victory stand in front of the cross rather than hanging from it. Arms are horizontal, voluntarily outstretched, and the eyes are open rather than closed, symbolic of his victory over death, a bejeweled crown instead of thorns. He is the Christus Dominator. The long robe is an Eastern tradition, and it tended to portray Christ in the role of divinely ordained high priest. The robe, or tunica, manicata, and belt suggest a priestly costume that Christ will supposedly wear during the Second Coming, from Revelations 1.13 clothed with a long robe and with a golden girdle. The symbolism of the robe equals sacred kingship or royal priesthood. More Voto Santo imagery. The uh, legend of the fiddler apparently originated with the Voto Santo di Luca is first recorded in the 12th century. A slipper and a chalice are placed on the altar below the statue's feet. The chalice was placed to receive offerings. Usually it was fixed and bottomless, connected to a tube that received offerings to a strong box below the altar. Now we come to 
Saint Ontcomer in the Netherlands or the Low Country. Saint Ontcomer means one who avoids something, and one who invokes her name at the hour of death will die on Kumer or without anxiety. The traditional pilgrim place was Steinbergen in the Netherlands. Her cult flourished in the 15th and 16th centuries, and there is still a street named after her in Steinbergen. The Netherlandish iconography features the tau shaped cross, and she is tightly um, tied with ropes encircling a long full skirt and usually a halo. There is no slipper, no feet, no fiddler here. This is presumably her father and the unsatisfied suitor. This is Aunt Comer from a book of hours from 1415, which is a medieval illuminated manuscript book of prayers for a young woman. Here is a miniature with St. Francis, St. Mary Magdalene, St. Dorothea, who is another uh, virgin martyr, and St. Ontcomer. Here she is bearded, holding her cross with the loose ropes. Uh, presumably showing her liberated state. More miniatures from the Book of Hours. Here she is with the fiddler and the chalice and her feet are showing. her father, the king. This is St. Um, Saint Wil Wilgefortis and St. Mary of Egypt. It's from the triptych of Adrian Reims by Hans Memling, 1480. Um, here she is holding her towel cross with a very faint beard. And St. Mary of Egypt We'll take a closer look at her later, but she's a repen uh, penitent prostitute who went into the wilderness with only three loaves of bread for sustenance. Her other portrayals show her completely covered in a fleece of body hair. So we have the martyr and the penitent, and they are both hirsute wild women symbolic of their basic animal nature and their untamed procreative powers. This is the triptych, the St. Wilgefortis triptych by Hieronymus Boss from 1495. Sometimes it's confused with the crucifixion of St. Julia, who is another um, martyred virgin. But in the detail, you can see that she does indeed have a beard. The Saint Oncomer legend gradually became one of the most popular saints of the Netherlands. The Habsburgs adopted her as one of their saints of their dynasty. Wilgefortis can be found embroidered on a liturgical garment that was part of the treasuries of the Golden Fleece, an order that became closely associated with the House of Habsburg over the years. So these liturgical vestments of the Order of the Golden Fleece are lavish, minutely gold-embroidered textiles preserved as part of the treasuries of the Schatzkammer of Vienna. A total of eight Burgundian vestments used only on special feast days 
when a solemn mass was celebrated by this highly ceremonial and prestigious order. They've been described as the most costly vestments in the world, also regarded as the finest work achieved in the art of European embroidery. Some detail. This is called the Cope of the Virgin Mary, and it's based on the style of Maester von Flamel, or Robert Campen. And you can see Wilgefortis portrayed right here, carrying her cross with her beard. So let's have a little closer look at this Order of the Golden Fleece. This is a painting by Rohir van der Weyden. And it's a portrait of Philip the Good, the Duke of Burgundy, who established the order in, 15, in 1430 during the marriage celebration to his wife, Princess Isabella of Portugal. Another van der Weyden painting. Isabella's mother was the granddaughter of Edward III of England, who founded the Order of the Garter. The oh, here's a portrait of Baldwin de Lino, uh, of Lenoy by Jan van Eyck. He was one of the first knights of the order. On admission to the order, the new knight laid one hand on the gospel and the other on the cross of allegiance, which contained a true particle of the true cross. He pledges his loyalty to the sovereign order, sovereign of the order, then receives the neck chain of the order. The golden fleece is only granted for life. It must be returned to the Spanish monarch whenever the recipient deceases. There have only ever been 1,200 recipients since its establishment, making it the most prestigious and exclusive order of chivalry in the world. So in all accounts of the first meeting, which occurred on November 30th, 1431, um, 24 knights were inducted, and the jester and dwarf, Madame d'Or, performed at the creation of the order in Bruges, 1430. She's described as a dwarf no higher than a boot and a gymnast of incomparable beauty, nimbleness, and athletic vigor. So this is the picture that comes up when you search for Madame d'Or. But this isn't Madame d'Or. This is another court dwarf named Maria Barbola, the official court dwarf with the title of Enana de la Reina, dwarf queen in the household of the Habsburg king. Philip the Fourth of Spain. Court dwarves were owned and traded amongst people of the court and delivered as gifts to fellow kings and queens. But this gives us an excuse to look at one of the greatest masterpieces ever painted by Diego Velázquez or Velázquez. He was the leading court artist of King Philip IV of Spain in the Baroque period. This is his masterpiece called Las Meninas from 1656, The Ladies in Waiting. It's one of the most widely analyzed works in Western painting. It's been described as representing the theology of painting itself and the true philosophy of the art. So the Order of the Golden Fleece was supposed to be a Christian order, so the choice of the Golden Fleece of Colchis as its symbol was controversial since Jason, of Jason and the Golden Fleece, was willing to commit perjury to obtain the fleece. So they identified it instead with the Fleece of Gideon that received the Dew of Heaven. 
from the book of Judges 628. Non-royal knights of the Golden Fleece were forbidden to belong to any other order of knighthood. <clears throat> the Golden Fleece is a symbol of authority and kingship. And here is the collar designed with back-to-back -back fire steels, which are supposed to look like a bee for burgundy, separated by the flint. Here is a portrait of Charles III with his Toisan d'Oro, or Golden Fleece. This is a portrait of Charles V by Baron van Orley, a Dutch Renaissance painter. Which I could just stare at this painting all day. It's stunning. This is Charles VI, the Holy Roman Emperor, wearing the robes of the order, making his hand sign here. Emperor Franz Joseph I of Austria in the regalia. This is uh, Cosimo de' Medici wearing the collar by Bronzino. Prince Albert wearing the Spanish neck insignia. Duke of Wellington also wearing toys on d'oro. This is Philip I, the handsome, conferring the order on his son, Charles of Luxembourg. And this is King Philip the Sixth, conferring the order on his daughter, Princess Lenora. Today, two branches of the order exist: the Spanish and the Austrian fleece. The current Grand Masters are Philip the Sixth of Spain and Karl von Habsburg. Another tea drinker, apparently. The um, <clears throat> this is Christoph Schönborn, the chaplain of the Austrian branch, Archbishop of Vienna and he's said to be a contender to be the next pope. And he was involved in some controversy. This is Conchita Wurst or Thomas Neuwirth. And let's have a look at this ceremony at St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna. Conchita Wurst providing some bearded virgin imagery in the ceremony. Gib uns einen wachen Blick, nicht nur hier, sondern auch an allen anderen Orten. Lass uns die Welt und ihre Menschen wirklich wahrnehmen, damit der Verfolgung derer, die ihre Identität anders leben als die meisten, aufhört. Hilf uns, jeder Ausgrenzung und Diskriminierung zu durchbrechen. Lass uns hinsehen und achtsam sein. Lass uns immer wieder Schritte machen auf die zu, die anders sind als wir selbst. Wir bitten dich. St. Stephen's Cathedral is no stranger to controversy as previously it hosted a 
an exhibition of homoerotic art featuring this portrayal of the Last Summer, or the Last Supper, devolved into a homosexual orgy by Alfred Herdlicka. Here's Sarkozy receive, receiving the Order of the Golden Fleece from King Juan Carlos. She's looking very pleased with herself. This is Sarkozy's coat of arms featuring the Golden Fleece. All of them featuring the Golden Fleece, symbolic of kingship and authority. Princess Beatrix. This is the coat of arms of the House of Habsburg. Here is the Toison d'Oro. The knights were said to sit in choir stalls like cannons, and these are their armorial plates behind them. Let's have it. A look at a few of them because they are rather stunning. All featuring the golden fleece. This is the neck insignia of the Austrian branch. And I'm going to have a little break here and we'll see you shortly for part two.